welcome to this special unplugged sort of pregame show. Let's call it that. Because the bets have been set, the fridge is stocked. I personally wish we had some good wine, but never mind. In about 40 minutes, probably a little more, President Obama will deliver his State of the Union address. And to give us a lay of the land and make a few maybe risky predictions, I'm joined by our White House correspondent and historian Mark Noller, and at the news desk, Chief Foreign Correspondent Lara Logan, and Republican strategist Kevin Madden. Welcome all. So Mark, this speech we know already is about two-thirds devoted to jobs in the economy. What else is he going to talk about? Is that too much emphasis on one thing? Well, not in the view of the White House, Bill. President Obama wants to show Congress and the nation that he gets it. He understands there's a lot of anger and frustration among the American people. It was certainly reflected in the White House view in the elections of two Republican uh, governors last November and in the election of a Republican senator from Massachusetts to take the seat long occupied by Teddy Kennedy. So he figures this is what the, the public is angry about. That's what he's got to talk about. Is that it? Well, he, they do think that as well. They think, uh, and the polls show them, the polls show them that uh, the number one issue of concern to the American people uh, is uh, jobs and the economy. And so the president wants to show he understands it. He'll be discussing steps. He'll be taking alone and with Congress in order to give the economy a boost and try and promote job creation, both through the use of government funds and by giving tax breaks to uh, small businesses in order to uh, spur uh, private sector hiring. All right. Well, Kevin Madden, does that sound like more of the same to you? Well, uh, I think it's 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 probably um, has uh, more to do with a little bit of a reset of an agenda that he hoped uh, was going to be a lot more successful at the beginning of this year. Uh, I think Mark's exactly right um, that he's going to focus entirely on jobs, entirely on the economy, because that is the number one uh, that's the number one anxiety that the American public has. And I think what we've seen over the last year has been this sort of disconnect between um, Washington's priorities, the Democrats and Barack Obama, President Obama, and the American public's uh, priorities. They see a, uh, you know, they see they see a Washington kind of uh, focused on health, only on health care. They see uh, them focused on bailouts, and they're spending a lot of money. And they seem like they see that that is a sort of disconnect from what they want to see every single day, which is they just simply want to see the economy get started again. And they don't think that the priorities that Washington has had have uh, have been capable at addressing that. What could he say that would make Republicans want to work with him? Anything? Tax, or is it tax, or, tax or is relief? It? I think there's going. I think there's going to be uniform agreement around any time. Any time the president talks about tax relief, any time he talks about um, targeting uh, some of his uh, economic initiatives at small business. Right now, Republicans see a great opportunity, and that is to align ourselves with this um, this populist anger right now, but also align ourselves with the middle class and Main Street. Um, President Obama and the Democrats right now have lost independence and they've lost the middle class right now because they, what they see is a dysfunctional Washington spending too much money on the wrong things and not focused on Main Street and job creation. So, Laura, foreign affairs. I mean, you just last night did the long takeout on terrorism and we know that this is a big issue, but uh, we don't hear too much about it from the White House. What do you think the president needs or is likely to say about that? Well, I spoke to his top advisor on counterterrorism just recently, and the big issues are homegrown terrorism is on the rise, an increase in domestic terror plots, um, the fact that more and more Americans, citizens, are being recruited into al-Qaeda. And this is what some experts call the blonde-haired, blue-eyed brigade. It's not just, you know, Americans of Islamic or Arabic descent. It's all kinds of Americans. And, and what makes it so difficult for the intelligence community and law enforcement is that the only thing any of these people have in common, the one common denominator and the only common denominator is that they're Muslim. Otherwise, everything varies. So there's a, there's a real sense as well that in spite of what some people say about Al-Qaeda being on the ropes and all the rest of it, the evidence is to the contrary. In fact, Al-Qaeda has offices, if you like, all over the world right now. And they're showing that they can reach out and touch America from places as remote and austere as Yemen, for example. So, I mean, there's definitely a sense that um, terrorism is on the increase 
and the White House needs to show a strong hand in dealing with that. And this administration has not been shy about that issue. President Obama has authorized, you know, more drone uh, strikes in on both sides of the border in Afghanistan and Pakistan than the previous administration did in, in its entire, you know, last term. And we seem to have all but gone to war in uh, Yemen. Well, <laughs> you know how these things work. Okay. There are a couple of issues, Mark, that I'd like to get back to you on. I mean, for instance, the president uh, will talk about some other things. We know that. But uh, give me, if you can, a, a good, you know, a little bit of cocktail party chatter about some of the interesting stuff. You've seen, as have I, a whole lot of these State of the Union messages. And I just wonder, uh, give us a couple of facts that nobody really knows. Well, uh, tonight is the third time President Obama has addressed a joint session of Congress. It's his first speech, uh, State of the Union speech, but uh, you may remember or you may not that uh, last February he addressed a joint session discussing his economic goals for the year a month after he took office. And then in September, he gave a speech on health care reform. Clearly, it didn't do much because he wasn't able to get his plan enacted. In addition, uh, this will be the 181st State of the Union address uh, that has been given. Now, um, it makes you wonder why they bother, doesn't it? Well, it certainly does. Can you remember a, uh, a, a line from a recent State of the Union address? I really can't myself, and I, you know, you and I cover these for a living. Uh, most of these uh, speeches over history were given just a written report sent to Congress. Nothing in the Constitution says uh, the president must appear in person in order to uh, deliver his speech. Uh, in, in, over history, only 81 times has an American president gone to Congress and uh, given these speeches in person. And it really began in earnest uh, with uh, President Woodrow Wilson. Right, I, I must say most of Washington now regards it as an ordeal. Kevin, does it have any effect? Does the State of the Union message mean anything? Well, You're a political strategist. Yeah. Well, look, it, it offers you an incredible opportunity um, to condition the political environment uh, as best you can with as much control for one night that you'll probably ever get. Um, you know, the, the American public right now has uh, anxiety. Uh, the American public is looking at Washington, the entity, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, as a, as a, as a dysfunctional place. Uh, and the president, this is a president who came in as somebody who's going to be a vessel for change and a vessel reform. And I think largely this year he spectacularly failed on that. If anything, he's been captive or has become captive to the status quo and seen as a defender of the status quo. He has an incredible ability tonight to, again, reconnect with those same people who put him into office as somebody who's a reformer, somebody who's ready to, again, challenge these dysfunctional um, uh, uh, institutions in Washington and once again be, reclaim a mantle of reform. Now we don't know if he's going to be successful or not. We don't know if he's going to be able to persuade people. But State of the Union addresses are that one moment in politics where you get the stage to yourself as president uh, at least for 65, 70 minutes and then everybody runs to statutory hall, statutory hall and starts uh, uh, trying to spin it their way. But it's an extraordinary opportunity in a, in a, in a very cluttered media environment. It, it, it is and Laura I'd like to ask you quickly how is it received in the rest of the world? What does the rest of the world make of a speech like this? Well, you know, a lot depends on the president and the times. And these are very difficult times internationally, and there is a lot of interest in this particular president. So, in fact, Obama's uh, messages do resonate overseas. In fact, sometimes more than they do in the United States. People pay very close attention to what he says. They believe in him. There's a lot of faith internationally in Obama. And even though there's a recognition that he is not a one-man panacea for the world's problems, there is a belief that he heralds a new era for America back in the world and back engaging. And so people will be paying, you know, people who are interested in this kind of thing to pay close attention to what he says. Any predictions about uh, how this will come out tonight? Predictions? Uh, well, I hear it's going to be very long. So uh, <laughs> my prediction is that uh, President Obama is going to be very successful at running out the clock so that maybe less people hear uh, Governor McDonald. <laughs> How about you, Mark? Any predictions? You know when we'll know if this works? On the day after the November 2nd elections, we'll see whether Democrats are still in control of Congress and by how much. Well, he has a safe prediction for okay. you. One thing I know from having met um, him is th and interviewed him is that he is very sincere about what he's trying to do. 
So there will be a lot of heartfelt kind of, you know, Obama putting himself into that speech. All right. Laura, Kevin, and Mark, thank you very much. We look forward to holding you accountable for whatever you said <laughs> after the speech. And right now, we're joined from across the Potomac in Arlington by John Harris, the editor-in-chief of Politico, to talk about the importance of tonight's speech for both the president and his party. Hey, John. How are you? Good evening. Uh, great. Uh, big, uh, big uh, stakes here tonight, huh? Well, uh, these are always big occasions uh, for the president, but I think they're bigger for Obama right now because he clearly needs uh, in some way to set the reset button uh, on his presidency and on the sort of drift of recent uh, events. And a, a speech like this before, uh, even in this age of fragmented media, states of uh, union addresses get uh, huge uh, audiences. It's one of the handful of occasions the president gets annually to speak to a, a, a great unified national audience. So there are tremendous opportunities. So he's talking to the huge audience, of course, but what about also uh, the message that uh, maybe is a little more subliminal to members of his own party and the opposition party? Uh, yeah, the message to his, uh, uh, his own party is, uh, is got to be buck up, and the message to the opposition uh, party is, has got to be beware. Uh, you, you know, this, this ain't over yet. Right. Um, I do think uh, there was a sense that in the wake of uh, Massachusetts, uh, a sense among Democrats that Obama didn't forcefully fill the, the, the sort of leadership void that his party was looking uh, for a more robust uh, message. Uh, uh, and instead, you know, a lot of people felt that they were kind of seeing the whites of the White House's eyes in that. Uh, so this would be a chance to, uh, to, to come forward with a more robust. Well, according uh, to our, our polling, and I'm sure your polling as well and others that we've all seen, there are about eight. Senate seats that are very competitive, and five of them are currently held by Democrats, right. including the majority uh, leader's seat, That's Harry right. Reid. So uh, the president uh, rallying his own troops uh, and and trying to help them with his his popularity, if it's still there, what do you think? Well, that's uh, you know that's an interesting paradox because the uh, in fact the the way he might be able to best help his uh, uh, his party is by not being overtly uh, political. Um, you, you know, we remember with, with Bill Clinton, who was uh, down far worse uh, after 1994 than uh, President Obama is now, uh, that he recovered uh, by uh, uh, seeming to strike a less uh, partisan le uh, and less political note. Uh, and, and as he recovered, his party did better. Uh, it goes against the instincts of most politicians who want to, uh, you know, by definition, they're fighters and want to be as partisan as possible. but. Uh, uh, typically, partisan notes have not gone over well in this particular form, in this format, the State of the Union. So I'd be surprised if he's too partisan. Well, take a look at health care on that, on that same note. I mean, you saw how, uh, how firmly the president endorsed his view of health care the other day on the road. And, uh, you know, Speaker Pelosi today said that not passing health care was not an option. Right. We get the same message today from the White House. Um, but any way you look at it, it really, health care reform doesn't look like it's in a very good place. Well, every, they're all saying uh, that uh, health care reform is a must and that it will pass, but nobody is laying out in any kind of detail, with any kind of specificity, what the path toward, uh, uh, toward passage is uh, now in this, this post-Massachusetts uh, environment that we're in. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, when I talked about sort of not filling the, the void, uh, that's one of the ways in which I meant that, that uh, there is not a, 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 a clear sense from the White House is, look, we have a plan that will uh, get this passed. And that entire year that we spent in 2009 with this as, our, uh, as the top Democratic priority won't be a wasted year. Uh, as you rightly point out, right now there's the very distinct possibility that it will be a wasted year domestically. What does this do to the, uh, to the president uh, in his sort of aura, his aura of power? Does he still have it? Is he losing it? There's been a lot of chatter about that in Washington. Uh, in my uh, experience, and I don't know if you, if you, what yours is, you've been at this a, a good bit longer than I have, but uh, the aura is all uh, based on sort of perceptions of success, and that if Obama were to give a good speech and that were reflected in, in, in improved poll ratings, uh, we'd say, ah, the aura of power is back. Uh, he could give a good, uh, what some people might call a good speech, but if the poll ratings stay low, then that projects weakness and his own party will be, uh, will be at his throat. I really think in terms of what other politicians respect, specifically members of Congress, the only thing they really respect or fear in a president is, uh, is power and popularity. And when a, uh, 
Uh, when a president has it, he can keep his party at heel uh, and keep the opposition to some extent at heel. Uh, when they sense weakness, uh, they, uh, like wolves, will go for the throat. But this president doesn't always deal in, in that currency. He uh, sometimes prefers to take the calmer, cooler, more rational approach. Uh, I agree. He is not, uh, uh, we've seen plenty of evidence that he's not as feared by his uh, party. Uh, the people are not as reluctant to cross him as uh, uh, typically presidents in the past have liked to be feared. Um, and um, um, anyway, the, the, you know, he's seen in 2009, he saw his governing strategy, the so-called Big Bang, in which uh, uh, three big things were, ha were to happen within the first 12 months, health care, cap and trade legislation to combat global warming, and uh, uh, financial services uh, regulation. All those were to pass, none of them passed. So that governing strategy, the Big Bang, uh, failed, and I think that's one of the things we're looking for uh, out of the State of the Union speech tonight is what is the new governing strategy. All right. Well, John Harris of Politico, thank you very much. We're watching the monitor here. We see the doors to the diplomatic entrance of the White House wide open. All the right. president about to come out and head for Capitol Hill. Any minute now. Any It'll minute. Be a big night. So thanks. Thank you.